and then go and finish getting ready. There we go. Spin out a little. Amazing. Right, you've got some things to do um, on the board. We've got loads of different words that Shakespeare put together to make two lines. Two really nice lines. I mean, they're all nice, aren't they? But I particularly like these two lines. Um, so you can either try and rearrange them to guess what two lines Shakespeare wrote, or you could just rearrange them any way you like to make an interesting sentence. Um, they are Frost's The, The, Alter rose in hoary headed off season's lap crimson the fresh fall uh, and also I'm so pleased with this question it is oh is it a trick question kind of I shouldn't have even said that right Shakespeare didn't have today's special effects obviously um didn't really have any scenery there is a, a part um of Midsummer Night's Dream where one of the characters has to go invisible what is the cheapest, easiest way you can think of to make a character be invisible on stage? Okay, I'm going to quickly finish pottering around and then flip you around and we'll get started. But you have fun with your words. Mm. I'm definitely not just going to sit here sipping coffee. I'm very busy and important. Sieve. Oh, yeah, it's a YouTube version. Let's, let's go big. I'm going to use a whole baking tray. Also, I had quite a lot of cocoa powder splash on my laptop yesterday, which wasn't good. Right, I'll be with you in a sec.
goodness, I'm sorry, it is late, isn't it? <laughs> she says, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so late. Taking out more time to pour a coffee. Right. Got a bee sting on my board. We don't need that. Okay, I'm flipping you around. Whew. Sorry, buddy. La 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 la. Up you. Hello, Theory of Science Alliance. It's the last Shakespeare lesson. I mean, if you're watching this on catch up, then it doesn't matter really, but we've done an introduction to Shakespeare, two Macbeth lessons, one Midsummer Night's Dream lesson last week, and this week we're looking at Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, the themes of control. There's loads of stuff to do with who's controlling who. I must say this is one of my favourite ones. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting theme that runs the whole way through Midsummer Night's Dream. You don't need to have seen the previous two lessons or four lessons or whatever to have seen this one. Uh, let's, let's just get going. So if you've been to my website and you've downloaded the worksheet, uh, you've got this in front of you, so it'll be a bit easier for you. you. I just want you to be thinking about this as I talk to you about the very first bit of the play, what happens at the very start. If you haven't got the worksheet, it doesn't matter. Just look at this right now. Here we are. So here's various characters. Some of them we heard about last week, but you'll meet them again. Theseus is the duke of this part of Greece. Hippolyta is his soon-to-be wife. They're getting married in a few days. Um, last week, we just called this guy Angry Dad, but his name is actually Aegeus. So we'll look at him a bit more properly today. Philostrate, uh, you can kind of think of him as a servant. He's like the wedding organiser, because Theseus and Hippolyta are getting married in a few days. Hermia and Demetrius and Lysander and Helena are the four lovers who love each other in various different ways or not. We'll look at that. Um, so I think there's various things they're being controlled by. They're, they are being controlled by each other, but also maybe the law, also time, also maybe an unknown power. So just think about, as I tell you how the play begins, who is controlling who. It could definitely be more than one, all right? So last week, um, I said that Midsummer Night's Dream starts with Theseus the Duke coming on stage and saying, I want to get married now. Let's do it a little bit more properly because obviously that is, that's not what he says. He actually says, now fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Nuptial means kind of wedding. So uh, the time of our wedding is coming nearer and nearer and nearer. Four happy days bring in another moon, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires. So straight, we're going to do an activity about the moon. And straight away, we're talking about the moon in like the, one of the first lines. So a waning moon, some of you will know this, it's a moon that is getting smaller and smaller to us, like not actually, obviously. Um, so obviously to us in the sky, it looks like the moon you'll sometimes notice. If you look up, you'll see like a, a full moon and then the next day it'll be a little bit smaller and then a little bit smaller and then you get like a half moon. I'm going to show you a beautiful sort of series of images on NASA's website because everything of theirs is copyright free um, to explain to you what I mean. So um, you probably know, right, that the shape of the moon is not actually changing. It stays pretty much a sphere and it's just as it moves around, the sun shines on it in different ways. Um, so when it's getting bigger, when more and more sun is shining on it, when it seems to be getting bigger, it's called a waxing moon. I have to remember the Karate Kid in that amazing film, The Karate Kid, he does a move like wax on. So I always imagine the moon is waxing on. And then the opposite is waning when it seems to be getting smaller. Here's the, here's the, the picture. Um, NASA, how, how we science communicators love you. So this is it getting bigger and bigger as it turns and more and more sun shines on it. And here we can see that it's disappearing. So what Theseus is talking about is it's about, it's about now. We've got about four days of moon left until we get this period of complete blackness where you can't see the moon at all. And then it starts to get bigger. So it's a bit, it's a bit weird. A new moon is actually when you can't see the moon at all. So it goes from full, smaller and smaller and smaller, and the time when you, there's no sun shining on it from our point of view, that is a new moon. So that's, that's kind of what they're talking about. Although actually Hippolyta has a next line, uh, which is a little bit, a little bit different to that, but I, I think they're talking about a new moon. Um, Hippolyta, calm, wise Hippolyta who incidentally is a queen already. She's queen of the Amazon. Theseus has kind of kidnapped her and brought her back to his place so they can get married. She says, four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. So it's, it's four days, four nights until this, this new moon, although it's actually going to be a very, very small silver bow. 
So we've, we've got already, these are just the first two lines, basically, of the play, and we've already got loads of talk of the moon. So the moon is watching them, right? The moon is going to behold their wedding. I've put, even the duke, who is obviously very important, has something above him, literally above, lol, yeah, because the moon is in the sky, but you could properly get a mark for that in an exam. Don't write lol, though. Okay, so then Theseus turns to this poor guy, Philostrate, who hasn't said a word yet, and says, go, Philostrate, stir up the Athenian youth, youth to merriment. So I'm feeling really happy. I want to have a party. Go and get all the young people of Athens to also be merry. And Philostrate, bless him, just kind of skulks off to do that. And then Theseus says something really dark. He turns to Hippolyta and says, Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love doing the injuries and then basically has a line like but now we're gonna have a great time this is not how we woo people these days children okay so Theseus and Hippolyta in the play they're usually shown as like a really loving couple but but it's very clear that he has come to where she lives with his sword possibly possibly killed all the people that she was living with we, we don't know injured her maybe meant to, we don't know how he's injured her but anyway he's he's very much brought her over even though maybe now she's having having a nice time. I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, on comes Angry Dad. And his line is, Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke, or renowned duke. So Aegeus comes on, red in the face. He's very angry. He's dragging his daughter Hermia along. And Theseus says, Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? And then Aegeus goes into his sometimes quite amusing rant. Full of vexation come I with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. And on comes Demetrius, this man. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. So there's a lot of talk about uh, consenting in Midsummer Night's Dream. Consent means uh, I am, I'm letting you. If you consent, then you allow somebody. So Aegeus, angry dad, is has Demetrius has his consent to get married to Hermia. So Aegeus wants Demetrius to get married to Hermia. Stand forth, Lysander. Along comes Lysander. And my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Brilliant. And he goes on. It's very angry. Thou, thou Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung. There's the moon again. So the moon's watching them as well. The moon's watching everybody. Um, with cunning, I love this bit. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart. How romantic. Filched means like really stolen. Turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. So if we're talking about control, right, this is interesting. Hermia is supposed to be obedient to her dad, because dad. Um, but Lysander has like filched her obedience away. Whew. Okay, so let's let's come back to the sheet then, because we've had a, I think we've heard a real lot about control already. I'm going to slightly rearrange this if that's okay, so that we can draw some lines. So I'll put all the characters in the middle, and then have the things that might be controlling them around the outside. Right, well, should we start with the very easiest ones? What what do you think is the easiest one? What is it? Who is it? Very obvious what they are being controlled by, at least in the short term. Pausing for a second so that you can scribble if you wish or think. I think Philostrate is, is very obvious, right? Philostrate is being controlled by Theseus. He hasn't even said anything yet. Theseus just says, go, and then he goes. Um, Hippolyta, I think it's fair to say, is also being controlled by Theseus. I wooed thee with my sword. That sounds fairly controlling, doesn't it? Um, Aegeus, who do you think Aegeus is being controlled by? Well, I can... Angry Dad... He wants to be in control, doesn't he? But I mean, I think it's quite obvious that he's been controlled by Theseus as well because he's come to him for help. I think, should we just say everyone is being controlled by Theseus because Theseus is the Duke, yeah? Um, so that clears that up. What about Hermia? She's the daughter who sort of gets dragged on, who the dad wants her to marry Demetrius, but she's in love with Lysander and Lysander's in love with her. Who do you think is controlling her? I am going to say very much Aegeus, her dad, her angry, controlling dad. Um, but he had this line, right? With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. So possibly, 
I, I think possibly Hermia has been maybe a little bit controlled by Lysander as well. Demetrius, we haven't really heard from him yet, have we? He hasn't said anything. Who's he being controlled by? Well, I think really the only time we've heard his name up to this point is Aegeus barking, stand forth, Demetrius. So I'm going to say that Aegeus is controlling Demetrius as well. Lysander, eh, what do you reckon? I mean, I was. Uh, you could say that Lysander is being controlled by Hermia because he's in love with her. But uh, looking at what is being said, thou Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens, thou hast by moonlight at her window song. It's all very much what Lysander is doing to Hermia, I think, at the moment. It very much feels like Lysander is kind of in control of their relationship. So I'm going to say that Hermia isn't really controlling him, but Aegeus, again, barking, stand forth Lysander. I think Aegeus is at least trying to control Lysander. Helena, we haven't even heard her name mentioned yet. And Theseus, um, I'm going to say time, because he's the very first thing we hear him say, right, is, uh, is that he wishes time would pass by. And you might have, if you wanted to, instead of, you could have put with time the moon, because I think the moon so far is being shown, it's being used to show time passing by, right, as the moon changes shape, time speeds on, but Theseus can't make that happen. So maybe the moon's kind of more powerful than him, even Theseus can't control time. Right, let's move on. So Theseus and Hermia have quite an interesting little moment now. Theseus asks for her opinion. What? What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god. Your dad should be like a god to you. And Theseus says, Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. And then Hermia says, so is Lysander. I, th I think that's really interesting. And then Theseus just kind of quite calmly says later, um, well, in himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. So wanting means, if you're wanting something, it means you're lacking something. So uh, he's saying like, yeah, Lysander is a worthy gentleman, but he, he wants your father's voice. He doesn't have your dad's support. So surely in this case, Demetrius has got to be the worthier person. Um, why isn't Theseus furious about her back chat? Like, I mean, I suppose it depends how the actor says it, doesn't it? The person playing Hermia, because like she's in front of the Duke and all the Duke's kind of friends and important people. And, and he says, come on, like Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. And she just says, so is Lysander. Why isn't Theseus like really sort of embarrassed and angry about that? I mean, like I say, it depends. Like she, she might go, so is Lysander, or she might go, so is Lysander, you don't know. But still, it seems like, it seems quite a bold thing for, you know, a girl to say in ancient Greek times. Why do you think Theseus isn't cross about it? And I'm actually properly asking you that because I had an answer and then on Facebook yesterday, loads of other people said, very good answers. I mean, there's no such thing as like a better or worse, possibly better than my answer. <laughs> Put you in front of the question and then i'll tell you what they said why isn't theseus really why doesn't he get really angry when she back chats him so i said i think it's because he knows that he's in control He's not threatened like her dad Aegeus is. So Aegeus is sort of generally portrayed as being very kind of puffy, red in the face, very frustrated because he's worried about losing his power, right? He's losing control over his daughter. Whereas I think Theseus is perfectly comfortable with the fact that he is in control of the situation. So it doesn't matter if someone's a little bit cheeky because it's not threatening his power. But on Facebook, you said lots of wise things, but these are the ones I could remember. Someone said, because he likes her, like maybe he has got quite a close relationship with her. He calls her something like fair maid, doesn't he? Um, and then someone yesterday said, because he's in love too. And I thought, wow, that is such a brilliant point. Yeah, he can empathize because he is in love. And love is this big theme of Midsummer Night's Dream. So maybe it's like making him a kind of a better leader than a Geus because he's in love too. Anyway, moving on. I thought that was interesting. Um, so Hermia very quickly says, I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold. She doesn't understand where this amazing new kind of boldness of hers is coming from. Maybe some unknown power. 
Um, and Theseus says, take time to pause and by the next new moon, right? The sealing day betwixt my love and me. So this moon is counting down to loads of stuff. It's counting down to him getting married, his sealing day. But also now <laughs> at the new moon, um, Hermia has to, upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will or else wed Demetrius. You've got to wed Demetrius or die, but I'll give you a few days to think about it. Right, let's get our moon activity ready now. We've had so much talk of the moon. So for this moon activity, um, you need <clears throat> some flour. I, th I, th I don't think I've been doing this activity very well on Facebook the last couple of days, so I think I'm going to do it better now. I've got quite a wide baking tray, and I'm going to put a layer of flour on Maybe just like kind of my little th finger thick, maybe not even that. Do you need to see this? Do you know what it looks like when someone puts flour on a baking tray? I'm going to be posh and civet <laughs> so that we get a nice even coverage. There we go. Don't do it too near your laptop. I've got all, I've got cocoa powder in my crevices because uh, I got this too close to my laptop yesterday. So you don't have to use a sieve. Who uses a sieve? Even people on Bake Off don't usually use sieves, do they? Or some of them don't, and they still get good. Anyway, I've sieved it now, so that's that. Um, if you want to shake it around, you can do. It doesn't really matter. And then after you've done that, you need a really thin layer of cocoa powder. In fact, you know what? I'm going to put some more flour on because I've been putting too much cocoa powder on uh, every other lesson. I'm, I'm going to get it right today. We need more flour, a higher flour to cocoa ratio. There we go. Sort of made a little hill in the middle. Maybe that'll be good because then I can see what it's like when there's not as much flour. All right. So I've done that, <laughs> making clouds. And then we need quite a thin layer of cocoa powder <coughs> over the top. Um, and the other thing you need are maybe some little marbles or some ball bearings. So it's frantically glancing around wondering where hers have gone. Oh, there they are. Yeah, so don't put too much cocoa powder on. I keep, I've done it again, I've just done it again as I said that. I think it's, oh man, I think it's best to sieve the cocoa powder so that you get a very thin, even layer over. The, this is going to be the surface of our moon. It's right next to my laptop again, isn't it? There we go. So, there we go. Great. I've got a good feeling about this one, guys. Go over that bit. Splendid. So that's all you need to get your moon activity ready. We'll have a little bit more of a look at a con control and then we'll um, we'll drop some things into this and we'll talk about the moon. Uh, Sib can go down there. Right. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, so you can you be getting that ready? It's just, you can use a baking tray or a bowl. We're going to be dropping like little marbles or maybe stones onto it, so don't use like your finest china. But any kind of layer of flour with a layer of cocoa powder. <coughs> And just do that. I'm not going to drop anything like yet. But you can be doing that while I talk to you about what happens next. So uh, Lysander has a little word. Lysander suddenly gets a little bit, a uh, little bit full of himself and starts speaking up. He's talking about Demetrius. He's making a case for why he should be the one to marry um, Hermia. I am my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius's. And which is more than all these boasts can be. I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my rights? It was going so well until the last line, right? So I am as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. So in other words, I'm just as good as he is. Um, I actually love Hermia more than he does. My fortunes everywhere is fairly ranked, if not with vantage. Like, I'm definitely as rich as him. I might actually have a bit of an advantage over him. Um, and more importantly than everything else, Hermia really loves me. But then he sort of says, should I not prosecute my right? What a lovely way of saying, <laughs> I think I should get married to her. It's his right. It's his right to be uh, in love with Hermia. And, and then he has a right dig at Lysander. He properly drops, uh, at Demetrius rather, he really drops Demetrius in it. Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nedar's daughter, Helena. This is our first mention of Helena. So she's Nedar's daughter. We don't really have to worry about that. What he's saying is, made love these days sort of means like making babies with somebody. But in Shakespeare's time, it just meant like if you made love to someone, maybe you wrote them love letters or, you know, you kind of hung, hung out with them a lot and made it clear that you were in love with them. He made love to Helena and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. So Helena, we find out, is 
Uh, well, she's in love with Demetrius, right? But dotes is a weird word. Doting on someone, it sort of makes you think of a puppy. Like, ha, 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 I love you so much. Devoutly dotes. Dotes in idolatry. These are all words that you would associate with re religion. If someone's very devout, they're very religious. So we feel like maybe Demetrius is a bit of a god to Helena. Um, and then Theseus says something interesting as well in terms of power. Fair Hermia, fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate to death or to a vow of single life. Um, he's using we like queens say we, so he means him. Extenuate means uh, kind of make less. So what he's saying is I cannot make less the law of Athens. Like it, it was the law, apparently... I've only looked at the Shakespeare, not the history, but apparently in these days, it was completely the law that if someone wasn't doing what a dad wanted them to do, they could just kill them, basically. Maybe that's why Shakespeare said it in these times, because it's just more dramatic, isn't it? Uh, so yes, it is the law that Aegeus can say that he's just going to kill Hermia if she doesn't marry who, she want, who he wants her to marry, and there's nothing Theseus even can do about that. I think I've, yeah, I've just written that above there, look. Theseus can't change the laws of Athens, so if Homie doesn't obey, she'll have to die or live alone forever. Whew, right, there's a lot more control being mentioned. This is still only the first scene. We're not going to do every scene. Um, have we learned anything else about who is being controlled by who? We hadn't mentioned Helena, had we? Who's Helena being controlled by? Uh, I reckon Demetrius, eh? That's all we've heard. Is she, she devotes devoutly, dotes, all the t just in idolatry on him. Um, Theseus, who's he being controlled by? He's being controlled by time. But we've also found out that he is not above the law. And indeed, we can say that they're all being controlled by the law, right? At least at this point in time, they're all being controlled by the law. Um, and we've also heard that Hermia is being controlled by some sort of unknown power that is making her feel very bold, but we don't know what that is. So Lysander and Hermia, we looked at a bit last week, um, they decide to run into the forest. He actually says... I mean, he doesn't actually say this, but basically he says, let's run into the forest where the law cannot follow us. <gasps> oh, oh, so it's all been quite orderly, right? At the start of the play, everyone's having to obey the law. They're going into the forest now where the law doesn't obey. The, the law can't follow them and Theseus can't follow them. Oh, a bit more interesting. Maybe there's going to be uh, some lack of control coming up. Just drop my Lego on the floor. I'm just just grabbing bits of Lego now. It's fine. Uh, and Hermia, as we saw last week, agrees. So they run, they decide to run into the forest together. What we didn't look at yesterday is actually Helena comes along at this point and Hermia says, oh, hi, fair Helena. Basically, how are you? And Helena sort of strops on and says, call you me fair, that fair again and say, Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair. Oh, teach me how you look and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. What a lovely rhyme. So Hermia, you're the one that's fair. That means beautiful in these times. Um, teach me how to be so fair so that Demetrius can love me as much as he loves you. And Hermia's advice is, well, the more I hate, the more he follows me. Helena says, the more I love, the more he hateth me. At which point Hermia says, fair enough. Well, his folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. Like, if he's been foolish, then that's it's not really my fault. And then Helena very cleverly says, well, none but your beauty. Would that fault were mine? So, well, it's, it's no one's fault but your beauty's fault. And I wish I had that fault. So Demetrius would love me. Um... And I think what Helena says next is really great and interesting. Um, so you would think probably from that exchange, right? If someone's saying to someone, oh, teach me how to be beautiful, you'd think, oh, she's really down on herself. Like, she really doesn't think that she's beautiful. It's really sad. Um, Lysandra and Hermia leave to run off to the woods. And Helena has this very famous line that kind of changes everything, really. I really like it. So... Lysandra and Hermia just kind of back away slowly to do their romantic thing in the woods. And Helena almost immediately says, through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. Straight away. Do you know what, everyone? Everyone in the whole city thinks that I'm just as beautiful as she is. It's just Demetrius doesn't think so. So it's actually, she's, I think she's perfectly comfortable with how she looks. She's just really annoyed that Demetrius doesn't understand how beautiful she is. And this is a real theme running the whole way through Midsummer Night's Dream. It's just loads of people stropping around saying, I'm doing everything right and I'm not getting what I want and I don't understand why and it's so unfair. Okay, let's do the moon activity. I'm gonna get my little marble and my bouncy ball 
because we've had a lot of talk about the moon uh, in a Midsummer Night's Dream. So we need to talk about what the moon meant, just a little bit of science, what the moon meant in Shakespeare's time. So we've looked at how Shakespeare scientific discoveries sort of just being made just frustratingly just a little bit after maybe we need them to be for them to feature in Shakespeare's play so shake people were pretty much still thinking in Shakespeare's time although they're starting to think otherwise that God made earth for humans everything on earth is for humans and um earth is surrounded by the heavens kind of where God is right so the heavens are perfect because God is perfect and the heavens are like God's domain. So people believed that the things in the sky that were part of the heavens, they were perfect as well. So when Shakespeare was writing with some nice dream, everyone believed that the moon being a part of the heavens was a perfect sphere, just a beautiful sort of white glowing ball in the sky. And then things start to change. Like I say, kind of if you like science and Shakespeare, you sort of feel like, oh, what if he'd found out earlier? But anyway, people think the heavens are better than Earth, so the moon is a smooth sphere. Um, Shakespeare is born into this thinking in 1564. In 1595, he writes A Midsummer Night's Dream. And in 1610, Galileo improves the telescope and discovers that actually the moon is really rough like Earth and has valleys and mountains. And that has a, a massive impact on how people view the heavens and the earth and humans place on earth um, and in 1616 16, Shakespeare dies so maybe you heard about it but he certainly didn't have time to put it into a Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, so yeah the moon is has all these craters right because it's being constantly bombarded by stuff from space asteroids and rocks that are orbiting the sun uh, comets are kind of chunks of ice and dust that are also orbiting the sun and sometimes they smash into the moon they things like that do smash into earth as well um but we've got an atmosphere that protects us and also because we've got air particles <laughs> that's my bouncy ball bouncing away because we've got air particles all around us on earth um they move around right so that's the wind and also we've got tectonic plates basically stuff on earth is constantly moving so you don't get craters on earth because when you do get one the signs of it are quite quickly sort of eroded away or weathered away. Whereas on the moon, there's no air particles, right? There's no atmosphere on the moon. So what happens on the moon stays on the moon. So when an asteroid hits the moon, it just makes this crater, which just stays there, which is why the moon is covered in craters. And this is a beautiful activity, which I did not make up. It's a classic, this, to show how craters on the moon are formed. So let's say that my bouncy ball, ball is, a, is a meteor. Just gonna drop it on and let's see what happens oh so much better than yesterday oh thank you people for watching this youtube version oh my goodness i'm so embarrassed that i did a really rubbish version on facebook that is awesome that's just like moon's creator okay i'm gonna try the marble so you'd be doing this too if you've got the stuff oh so lovely all right i'm just gonna uh rescue that with oh mess up my creator Oh, I could just do this all day. I won't. We, whoa, oops. <laughs> That's where I got the laptop yesterday. Okay, brilliant. So this is, yeah, a really lovely, I don't know who made this up, some genius science teacher of your, um, oops, that's just my, wait, wait, hang on. Uh, stabby, just, okay, wait, just, just stabbing the, never seen that bit on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> Might have just put a, fil I don't think I've put a filter on. Um, Yes. So the last question you might have about that is, uh, why do the craters of the moon look like these these different colours? Shall I take you back to that beautiful moon picture so we can see how close our model is to the actual moon? Unfortunately, it's getting lighter and darker and lighter and darker. Never mind. Um, so, yeah, you'll notice that the craters have these kind of white stripes splaying out for them, right? Um, here we go. There's a lovely big one there. Why is that? Well... There is no weathering on the moon, but the moon does have the sun shining on it and the, the solar wind hitting it. It's basically just lots of tiny little particles. So the very top layer of the moon does react. Um, the sort of minerals that are on the moon do, do react and slightly change colour. So the top of the moon is slightly darker and the material underneath that is lighter because it hasn't been hit by the solar wind, etc. So that's why, as we've shown here, um, when something hits the surface of the Earth, the lighter material kind of comes up and splays out. And that's why craters look like that. It's nice, isn't it? But yeah, astronauts who have walked on the moon, their dusty footprints are still there. 
because there's no wind to move it around. It's amazing, isn't it? Imagine being an astronaut, knowing that your footprint is still on the moon. It's so cool. Anyway, we better crack on. Um, yes, so there's loads of references to the moon in Midsummer Night's Dream. I think more than in any other Shakespeare play, if you get the script of Midsummer Night's Dream and you just like search for the word moon, at least 52 references come up. The moon's doing a lot of work in Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, all these different lines. They're waiting, obviously, for a new moon, so it's showing time going by. Oberon, the king of the fairies, who we'll meet in a sec, he says, Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. Uh, see our moonlight revels. This is kind of, um, you sort of quickly get the idea that everything's kind of coated in moonlight, right? Like almost maybe it's not real, like it's a dream, like things are a little bit shadowy, I don't know. Uh, Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, says Titania, pale in her anger, washes all the air. The governess of floods. So the moon is definitely a woman in Midsummer Night's Dream, right? And has a lot of power uh, we talked about last week how Oberon says, I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon. So the moon is uh, watery, she's in charge of floods, she controls the time in a way. Um, yeah, she watches everything they do. Right, let's move on. Finally, we get to Act 1, Scene 2, and we meet Bottom, who we met last week. Um, Theseus and Hippolyta are going to have a play put on for them at the end of the play, if you see what I mean. So the end of the play, A of a Night's Dream, is a play. Quince is the director of that play, and Bottom is one of the actors in the play. And we said last week how uh, his name is actually Bottom. <laughs> it was funny then, and it's still funny now. And he stands out as being very confident and outspoken. That's all we said, but let's have a little look at what Bottom actually says. So they all come on, and Bottom quite quickly says to Quince, you were best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. So in other words, come on, director, take a register. So Quint says, answer me as I call you, Nick Bottom, the weaver. And Bottom says, ready, name what part I am for and proceed. Like, what's my part in the play? And Quint says, you, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. And Bottom says, what is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? Is Pyramus like a, a, a bad guy or is he the lover? I think if we're talking about who has control in this play, that's really interesting. Um, he tells the director to take a register, so the director does, and then and then Bottom has to ask, what part have I got in this play? And even when he hears what part he's got in the play, he doesn't know what that part is. Um, so let's have a little look at, we've looked at who's controlling who, let's look at how each character tries to control their situation. This is hopefully just a, a fairly straightforward, like, matching task for you. Um, I've got the characters here again, Theseus, Aegeus, Angry Dad. And then the lovers, Hermia, Demetrius, Lysander and Helena. And then we'll stick bottom on as well now. Um, how is each of them trying to control the situation? You don't have to like perfectly match one to one. Um, maybe some of them you think they're controlling their situation in a couple of different ways. But if you've got the sheet in front of you, just draw some lines. Or you can just think about it if you haven't. Some of them are running away. Some of them are getting advice. Some of them are talking a lot. I've put controlling other people. That's obviously could mean a lot of things. Some of them are punishing people if they don't obey. And some of them are just waiting to see if things work out. Which one of those methods of control do you think each character is using? I'm just going to keep dropping things on my flower while you do that. Oh, yeah. Turn my coffee into a mocha. Got to go bad with. Have you done it? Have you got a few where you can't decide? I've got the answers written down here, and I'm even having done this lesson a couple of times. I'm thinking, oh, let me change them a little bit, actually. <clears throat> so I put Theseus, it's just waiting to see if things work out, isn't he? He's pretty chill. Ah, we'll just give it a few days and see if things decide for themselves. Um, Aegeus, yeah, is definitely punishing people, nay, killing people if they don't obey him. That's one way of trying to do it. Hermia is running away. Hermia and Lysander, the two who are actually in love with each other, I've put, they are both running away. Um, some people on Facebook were saying that Demetrius is running away. I don't really think he is, actually. He's... 
He's chasing Hermia, isn't he? He wouldn't have run away if she hadn't run away. Um, I've put he's trying to control other people, maybe, because he's sort of trying to make Hermia love him. You could say that... I've put he's talking a lot. I don't know if I agree with that now, actually, but I was just sort of thinking how really his only way of trying to control his situation is trying to persuade Hermia that, that she should be in love with him. Uh, Lysander's definitely running away. It was his idea. Helena, again, I don't think she's really... She's not running away to try and control her situation. She, uh, what is her situation? She really wants Demetrius to be in love with her. So I've put getting advice because she asked Helena, like how she could be more beautiful. But I don't really know if she actually meant it. I think she was probably just angry. I think she's talking a lot, isn't she? We saw a bit last week how she's basically just chasing Demetrius through the forest going, come on, be in love with me. Or don't be so attractive. Choose one. <laughs> and, and bottom... I agree with you if you said he's just talking a lot. Because that's maybe all he can do. How much control do you think Bottom has on a scale of 1 to 10? Where 0 is no control at all and 10 is complete control. More control than time itself. How much control do you think Bottom has in this play? Just quickly, based on what you've seen, what's your instincts? How much control does Bottom have? I haven't written an answer on the boards. Uh, most people on Facebook were sort of saying, quite a lot of people were saying sort of zero, one and two. Some people said five. I tend to agree that it's it's not very much, is it? I think it's really interesting that he, not only is he kind of quite low down, you know, sort of class status wise in those days. Um, so he's controlled by the Duke, obviously, and the law. Um, but yeah, he doesn't even know what part he's got in the play. And even when he finds out, he doesn't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. It's like he doesn't know who his character is, right? He doesn't, so I don't think he has very much control. And I think that's important, really, because that makes it really funny when he gets the head of a donkey magically. Um, and Titania, the queen of the fairies, who's very important, falls in love with him. Say, sweet love, what thou desirest to eat. That's only kind of funny, isn't it? If he doesn't have any power and suddenly a really powerful person is, is acting like he's got loads of power. It's funny. At least it was funny in Shakespeare's time when someone who doesn't have any power is suddenly act, sort of everyone's acting like they're a god. It's amusing. So this leads us nicely onto the fact that the natural world is also in complete chaos. If you had a go at this little activity at the beginning, I said that Shakespeare uses all these words here to make a couple of lines to show it's to show that um, the natural world is in chaos. And the, the words that he put together, the order that he used are the seasons alter. The seasons are changing. The seasons alter. Hoary headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose. Isn't that great? Hoary headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose. So I don't think I'd have put fresh and lap together, but presumably the crimson rose, the red rose, has just bloomed because, I don't know, maybe it's the summertime. And um, it, so, so the lap of the, fresh, of the rose is fresh. But then the frost falls into it straight away because all the seasons are all mixed up because everyone's very confused because the natural world is in chaos. Um, there is some, I don't know, you, you could possibly say that Oberon... There's an argument for him being in control of the natural world or in control of nature, or he's certainly got some influence. We saw last week how Oberon, who is the king of the fairies, puts a magical flower into Tanya's eyes to make her fall in love with the first person she sees. That's why she falls in love with Bottom, who is a donkey. Um, there's another interesting thing about Oberon, which brings us towards the end of the lesson, because I asked you at the start, how might a character become invisible on stage. So Oberon is the character who gets to secretly watch the other characters by making himself invisible. I mean, there's quite a lot of power there, isn't there? If you can watch people and they can't watch you. And I, I, how does Shakespeare make this magical effect happen? I was hoping that you'd come up with loads of complicated things like, oh, maybe he puts a blanket over himself or he could hide behind a tree that was on stage. Uh, no, he just says it. <laughs> he just says, I am invisible. So then the audience knows that he is invisible. And that's it. Love it. Oh, Shakespeare. Who needs stuff? Who needs stuff when you've got words, eh? Um, someone quite wisely pointing out on Facebook yesterday how the other actors obviously have to do quite a lot of work as well because you have to pretend that Oberon isn't there. But yeah, just, I'm invisible. You're invisible, isn't it? As far as the audience is concerned. Okay, so to wrap up then. Who is in charge in this play? What do you reckon? Who is in charge overall in A Midsummer Night's Dream? Don't say Shakespeare. Like they all just started saying Shakespeare yesterday. Yes, he is in control, I suppose, because he's writing it. But in the play, is it Theseus, do you reckon? Is it the Duke? 
Uh, is it maybe the moon slash the heavens? Or I suppose you could say time. Is it Oberon who is in overall con control of the play? Is it nature slash magic? Who's in charge? I've been really annoying. I haven't, haven't told you because, you know, as we know, there's no real right answers here, are there? As long as you can back up what you're saying. <sighs> I, I don't know myself. An absolutely incredibly wise thing that Olivia said. Um, in fact, I'm going to write it on the board and show you. Because it's a, a great way to end, actually. Maybe who's in control isn't even the right question. We were talking about how much control Bottom had uh, in the Facebook version of this lesson. And Olivia! long-term member of the Theatre of Science Alliance, said, well, Bottom doesn't have any control, but he's got a lot of influence. Oh, yeah. So he doesn't have any control, but influence means um, he has a big effect, like, on the play. And Bottom does have a huge influence on the play, doesn't he? Like, on the story, whereas Theseus, he's the Duke, he's in control. Does he have very much influence, actually, over the other characters? Like, by the end, I don't want to spoil it for you, because some of you haven't seen him in some Night's Dream, it'd be a good one for you to watch. But actually, he's only on at the very beginning and at the very end, and if you took Theseus out of the play, maybe it wouldn't very make very much difference to what goes, is going on. So maybe it's not the right question. I don't know, but well done, Olivia. Honestly, you lot. Um, and I put this in the worksheet. I'm not actually going to do this with you, but I think this is an interesting one. I think I mentioned briefly how... They've all got reasons why they should get what they want. Aegeus thinks that he should get what he wants because why? Hermia, Theseus, Bottom, Lysander, Helena. They've all almost got a speech which basically says, it's really annoying that I'm not getting what I want because I should because maybe I've got lots of money or just I'm a man or I really love somebody or blah, 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 blah. But anyway, my final question to you is, why is it called A Midsummer Night's Dream? Why is it called... A Midsummer Night's Dream. I mean, it's not set in Midsummer for a start. Let's not worry too much about that. Why is it a, Why is it called a dream? There's a lot of people on the internet writing about this. I actually haven't agreed with any of the ones that I've seen. That doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. It just means that if I was directing it, I wouldn't do it their way. Why is it called Midsummer Night's Dream? Um, uh, I'm just going to go over to my Facebook page where people who are watching live may have left me a little comment. If you're watching live, then every time I'm live on YouTube, you can't have comments. I always go to Facebook. Uh, I always put a post up on Facebook saying, you can always comment here and say hello, and then I'll comment back to you. Oh, brilliant, look. Oh, there's Jay and Daisy and Daniel straight away. Hello. Well, quite often um, <clears throat> people say it's called a Midsummer Night's Dream because maybe it is actually a dream. Whose dream? The lovers do end up falling asleep and, and waking up again. So some people think it's it's the four lovers that are having this dream. Some people think that the whole thing is a dream. Maybe Shakespeare fell asleep on a midsummer night and sort of imagined this or had a daydream. I think it's called a dream because it's, it's totally unrealistic. I think we start off seeing all these characters who are very cross and frustrated because they all can't understand why they're not getting what they want, even though they think they're doing everything right. And I think that's basically how life works. Whereas at the end, just because magic really um it all works out perfectly fine suddenly pretty much everyone apart from maybe angry dad just gets exactly what they want and it's all splendid and i think that's the bit that is a dream i think wouldn't it be nice if life worked like that and everything magically works out but it doesn't that's why i think it's a dream but you can obviously you might completely disagree with me i quite often disagreed with my english teachers and uh, I still think that I was right. <laughs> you just got to stand by it. So, hello, Amelia. We went to Shakespeare's birthplace. Oh, that's so... On Sunday. It's amazing how many of you are actually getting, like, to the Globe Theatre or Stratford-on-Avon in Shakespeare week. Oh, that's so cool. We have read 14 of the children's version of Shakespeare so far. And Amelia's favourite is Richard III. Nice. Very nice. Hello, Arthur and Abba. All right, you lot. So this was, just before I start chatting to people, this was the last Shakespeare lesson for now. I'm thinking maybe we just do it every every year when it's Shakespeare week. We'll choose some Shakespeare plays and dig into them. I might sprinkle some English lessons throughout the year. Um, but <clears throat> 
next term we'll be going back to science if you're watching live I think we're going to do nutrition after the holidays uh, because loads of people have asked about that. We'll look at like carbohydrates and fibre and vitamins and minerals and what they all do because that might be interesting. Um, yeah, if you want to support me, you can. Now is a good time to sign up because um, what happens is everything that I do is free, the lessons are free, the printouts are free, or my website is free to access and everything's available to watch there on Ketchup is all free! And I just say, if you if you want to pay me, then you can. Like, if you feel like I deserve to be paid for my services, then that's the only way that I make money, is people going to my website, which is called Coffee, uh, and signing up. So if you find a link to Coffee, it's on my Facebook page where it says sign up at the top. It's on my About section on YouTube. It's all over my website, if you go to my website. If you sign up to support me with about five pounds a month on coffee, I send you nice things to say thank you so much for contributing towards my wages. Um, and the thing that I send you is Theatre Science Magazine. I say that I'll just send it whenever I've written it. And it's just been so long. I'm really pleased with it. So it, yeah, it comes out whenever I've sent it. Um, but the next one, what I'm trying to say is the next one will be much bigger than usual because my lovely very long-term patient supporters have waited ages for it so it usually just comes in an envelope with like one little free thing but it's going to come in a box and it's going to have more stuff with it it's going to be quite hefty so usually as soon as you sign up i just send you the latest issue but i don't think you're going to be able to sign up with a fiver and me post you that box because it'll be i'll be like losing money <laughs> but if you sign up to support me now I'll send you the little welcome pack that everyone gets with like rainbow glasses and an explanation of how they work and pass magazine and then you'll be on the list to get the new one when it comes out which will be quite hefty uh yes so that's all I needed to say so yeah that's it really so sign up now is what I'm saying that's my that's my ad great time to sign up sign up now you'll receive a lovely welcome pack of nice things and then when it's done when it's done uh, we've got loads of editing to do, but it's close. It's very close. So I will hopefully get it finished and sent off during the Easter holidays. Yeah, I will. Um, then you'll be on my list to get that one as well. Hello, Arthur and Abba. Right, that is the end of my advert. Sign up for coffee. Thank you if you think I deserve £5 a month of your money. And I'm just going to get chatting to people. Oh, I think I'm going to get to Stratford on Avon in my summer holidays. So you lot are getting me really excited about it. Right, Arthur and Abba, you're the last uh, message that I've seen. Hello. Hello. Oh, Hugo, you do Little Brother School Run as well. And Chrissy is here as well. Splendid. Hello. Yeah, we're mixing home editing and school runs. It's like kind of the worst of both worlds. Like, I thought home editing meant that we could lie in. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's great that everyone gets to do what they want to do, isn't it? Uh, well, I hope your little brother has a lovely time at school. And hello, Hugo and Cresta. Hello. Hello, Sky and Holly. They want to let you know we've booked a super production of Mr. Live Stream. Oh, and it's your first Shakespeare play. No way. Which one is it? <coughs> Oh, that's so exciting. Oh, well, I'm really glad I didn't spoil it then. Bella, either way, the moon and nature is very much in charge, as the moon is mentioned a lot. Mum thinks it's love that's in charge. Oh, oh, really? Do you? But, like, this magical flower just changes who's in love with who. Don't you think that love is a little bit, like, flaky? Or maybe that's the point. Maybe love is in charge, and that's why things were a terrible mess. P.S. We were watching the CBeebies version in the car the other day. I haven't finished it, though. Oh, hello, John and Seamus. All right. I think the moon has been mentioned so much because it's magical and fits with the setting of the play. Yes. It was also quite unknown back then. Yeah, good point. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It was quite mysterious. Lara and Shakespeare Alliance, says Violet. <gasps> What's your favourite character from Midsummer Night's Dream? And Bella says Puck for sure. Yeah, we didn't mention Puck today, did we? Because Puck is Oberon's kind of servant. So I just couldn't bring him in. Maybe we should have done. Edmund, hello. Who's your favourite character from Midsummer Night's Dream? See, I would have, I think before I started doing these lessons, I would have said that Helena was my least favourite because she's so whingy. Oh, why aren't I as beautiful as you? Oh, why doesn't the just love me? Oh, I feel sick every time I don't look at you. But actually, no, I think she might be my favourite. I think she's the one that I'd want to play. I don't think I can because there's lots of comments about how tall she is. Uh, but anyway. Daddy's asleep. He was on night shift last night, last night rescuing people. If you don't know Bella Sad. We've got a wanted poster for him because he's so annoying. He's evil, basically. He's pure evil. Up all night rescuing people. What? He just can't... Just... Sort yourself out. Rescue... What's that even mean? Rescuing people. <sighs> he's just got his priorities all wrong, you know? Hello, Amelia. Kitty is also watching but getting in the way... Getting in the way of the screen. That's not getting in the way. That's just... That's just, like, 
that's just being rude. That is, there's cats getting in the way of the screen and there's just, look at that. Classic cat behavior. I can't believe I've done this whole lesson with a cat's bum in my face. I can't believe you would show me that. It looks like I'm, sn it doesn't matter, just, yeah, makes me feel a bit. <laughs> oh, these are some of our ideas, but it's tricky. Oh my goodness, wow, Bella's done lots of ideas. Oh, oh yes, paper has been cut up. We think the lives must start with the and fall. Oh, I see, that's genius, you've cut out the words and you're mixing up the words. Oh, that's a brilliant idea, like the thus and the fall and the alter. Yeah, I tried to give you the capital letters to help, but I could have given you a few more bits of punctuation. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you can't, if you can't see the comments, Bella and her mum have cut out all the words for the like hoary headed frost sit in the lap of the crimson rose or whatever, and have rearranged it. And there's just, it's just about 20 photos of them just rearranging and rearranging. <laughs> That's excellent. You should write a Shakespeare play. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were trying to keep the lengths equal and you're not. Yeah, it was iambic pentameter, right? I think. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. That was your clue. Clear's here. Better late than never. Covered in flower. Oh, clear. It's like you're talking about me. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, hello, Kerry and everyone. Hello. Hello, Imogen and Ophelia. Hermia loves Lysander, Lysandia loves Hermia, and I don't like Demetrius. Demetrius has sort of come across as a bit boring in these lessons, doesn't he? We didn't hear much about him. Hello, Violet. Hello, Suki and Arza and Yusa. Yusa, I've done it again. Eunice and Sala and Musa. Hello. Right, I've got to go, because uh, that was a long chat. And in half an hour, I'm doing the Lego Story Show, Bees versus Wasps, and it's chaos. You've heard me drop three pieces of Lego on the floor while I was doing the show. Oh yeah, see? Elizabeth is saying, see you in half an hour at Lego story time. Well, I mean, you will. Half an hour. It'd probably get me more like 33 minutes. <laughs> I think it's called a dream because it works out perfectly. Like a dream. Yes, that's what I think too. Aurelia, because it's Midsummer Night and a dream. Yeah, it's not Midsummer Night though. Isn't that so weird? I can't remember what time of year it is, but apparently it's not Midsummer Night. It's just messing with our heads. Right, okay. Thank you so much for your comments, you lot. Um, so I'll see some of you in 29 minutes for Lego Story Show. And if I don't see you, then have a lovely, lovely Easter. Because if you're watching live, then that's it now for two weeks. I'm going to, I was going to say, have Easter off. I'm going to spend a lot of Easter just like sipping coffee, coffee and typing. But at least I don't have to do loads of chatting. So it'll still be, still be relaxing. Change is as good as the rest. <laughs> and I'll see you in two weeks time for when we will start uh, nutrition. Yeah, but I will be sprinkling, I think, a few English lessons throughout the year because I've had some good ideas after doing these lessons. So thank you so much for your support <laughs> and I'll see you very soon. Bye!